that, Lord, everything yields to you tonight. God, the very power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is accessible to each of us tonight. And Lord, I speak that power into our situations, our circumstances. Lord, the, the, the disappointments of this past week. God, I speak power in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for the hope that is ours tonight because of the finished, complete work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. God, I thank you that we have the privilege and the opportunity to assemble tonight under the banner and the blood of Jesus tonight as your church, as your bride. And God, thank you that tonight the church is lovable, not because of who we are or because of our past, but God, the church is lovable because we have been redeemed and rescued by the precious, precious blood of Jesus. And we are your bride who you will come back for and you will return for. And so God, the church can be loved because it's not our church, it's your church. It's been covered, it's been atoned for. And so God, as we celebrate church and we even celebrate this local body through this series, I love my church. God, may we not miss it. May we not miss the reality that we can only love the church because of Jesus. And so God, may we take nothing away from the finished work of Jesus tonight. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You could be seated tonight. Well, it's a two-week mini-series, uh, and the title of the mini-series is "I Love My Church." Now, if you're following along on U Version, that's the online um, Bible app. Maybe on your iPad or your um, iPhone or uh, any mobile device. If you're using U Version. If you'll just click on that menu and you click live, um, our notes for tonight will pop up right there for you. You can follow along right there from your seat. Now let me also make uh, mention of this. Not only can you follow the notes, the scripture, all that is there for you, but also right from your seat, you can submit prayer requests. Maybe you've had a difficult week. Maybe you've got stuff going on in life and you just simply would like somebody to be praying with you and for you. You can submit that um, from your seat. Also, online giving is available right there in the app. And so um, there's something new there. Um, if you are a uh, man and you are a God-fearing man and you like to just hang out um, with other dudes and make Jesus the object of your worship, um, there is a conference coming up in November. And uh, there's information, a link in your Uversion notes, okay? Um, the, the conference is titled, Act Like Men. And so um, it is going to be a great, great conference, but there's a link of that even. Okay, so I love my church. Now that's kind of a, a, strange, a strange declaration, a bold statement, I love my church. In fact, I would venture to say not many people are accustomed to hearing someone say, Man, I just love my church. Now, we say things like, I love Starbucks. Like, nobody thinks anything big, or it doesn't sound out of the ordinary to hear someone say, Man, I just love Starbucks. In fact, right now, I love a big venti caramel ribbon crunch frappuccino from Starbucks. Like, that is what I love, all right? I mean, it is just caramel goodness. I love Starbucks. And when I say I love Starbucks, none of you are going like, really? Like, that's a shock. I mean, anybody that knows me knows I, I can get into some Starbucks, right? I also, I, I love baseball, but I don't just love any baseball. I love the St. Louis Cardinals. Like, that is my favorite ball team. Um, uh, just over a week ago, myself and Pastor Charles, uh, we got some free tickets to go to a Cardinal-Cubs game. And who doesn't love a Cardinal-Cubs game? I mean, I love it. 
I wish I could tell you the Cardinals won, but they lost three to nothing, but I still love being at the ballpark. I love just the fresh air. I loved um, sitting down close. I, I loved the, the roar of the fans. I love baseball. And when I say I love baseball, nobody's like, really? Like, that's not a shocking statement. It's pretty socially acceptable. Not only do I love Starbucks, and not only do I love St. Louis Cardinals, there's a group of people that I'm pretty fond of. I love my family. And so if I say, hey, I love my family, and by the way, that's my 13-year-old son. That's just the way he is all the time, okay? Um, but I do. I love my family. And if, if I were to declare I love Starbucks, I love the Cardinals, I love my family, most people aren't really surprised by that. But now you go along and you say, I love my church. When you start saying you love your church, something's up. In fact, if you declare you love your church, people will say you probably belong to a cult. Because it's just not normal to like your church. Because typically, um, it's not something to fall in love with. It's filled with judgmental, hypocritical people, and um, it's not a whole lot of fun. You don't enjoy going. You put in your time. You try to beat everyone else to the restaurant on Sunday afternoon. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You've been to that church, right? But to declare, I love my church, is somewhat takes people by surprise. Now, I just want to tell you, just, this is just one. I got lots of reasons. I've got lots of reasons I love Terra Nova Church. But I want to share with you one reason, particularly because he's not here tonight. But I love Terra Nova Church because this is our executive pastor. Like, I'm not even kidding. That's Charles Hickman back about 15, 20 years ago. Like, that's Charles Hickman before Jesus. I love our church because people like that, go back to that. People like that are not pushed out. In fact, people like that are redeemed, restored, fall in love with Jesus, and become our staff. Like, I love our church for that. Now, some of you go, well, you love Terra Nova Church because you have to, right? I'm the pastor. You have to love Terra Nova Church because they pay you. Well, can I just boldly declare before God and you and everybody else that will watch online, I love Terra Nova Church, listen, when I wasn't receiving anything, but I was the only one putting anything in. I've loved this church because the heartbeat of this church is different. It's like something that perhaps I've never experienced before, and I love our church. And so tonight, I want to cover three reasons that I love our church. I, I want us to kind of rally around three realities. Not just our church, but any church that yields and submits to the Holy Spirit and to the description and the declaration of who we are to be that we find in Scripture. In fact, tonight, we're going to look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, if you've got your Bibles. Matthew chapter 9. And, and let me say this as we're starting. I, I know there's, there's the rumor out there that just says, you know, I, I get it. I get that you love your church. You're the pastor. I, I get that everybody around here loves the church. But I don't, like, I, I could be a believer and not go to church. I mean, I know there's some of those individuals watching online right now. There's some that are viewing this video through YouTube, and they're, they're thinking, man, I, I don't have to go to church to, and I don't have to love the church to be a believer in Jesus. Well, let me just say this. In your marriage, you don't have to go home to stay married. Like, you don't have to go home to stay married. But you certainly can't have a healthy, vibrant marriage if you never go home. You can't be a full functioning, get all that you can get apart from the body of Christ, the bride of Jesus that he died for, that he will return to gather as his own, as messy, listen to me, as messy and jacked up as we are. Jesus loves the church, and Jesus died for the church. And I know some people go, you know, I'm not going to go up there to church because it's just filled with hypocrites. Hey, guess what? We got plenty of room for a few more. Because one of these days, that person will be the hypocrite in need of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And so I just wanted to clear that up from the beginning. 
Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. I think the first thing that we discover tonight is this. That through our church, through our church, Jesus provides hope for us. Jesus provides hope for us. Now, I don't know about you, but, but there was a time in my life and there have been seasons in my life where I've been up to my eyeballs in sin. And in my life, the situations and the circumstances that I have faced seemed pretty hopeless. In fact, I would venture to say, if I could put a picture of hopeless, this is kind of what it would look like. And I know some of you are laughing at that. But, but for some of us, we know how that feels, don't we? Some of us, we know how that feels. We've been in a hopeless situation. We, we've looked around and, and we've obsessed our life and, and it looks like it's absolutely hopeless. Well, through the body of Christ and through the church, I think we can discover that there is hope for the hopeless. In fact, at Terra Nova Church, our goal is to, to create an environment and an atmosphere that gives hope to the hopeless. No matter how far gone they may seem. Look with me in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Matthew 9, verse 9. We're going to meet a gentleman by the name of Matthew. And we're going to see and hear from Matthew and see how he hooks up with the person of Jesus. And if you look at verse number 9 in the text or on the screen, it says this. As Jesus went on from there, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. Now, now if, you're in the, if you're in the process and you're in the habit of making notes in your Bible, underline or circle, he saw. You see, this is the reality. Jesus saw Matthew. And, and, I, and I've heard this phrase before. You know, in, in church, pastors are just all about the numbers. Well, write this down, telegraph it, tell a friend, it doesn't matter, it's the truth. I am all about numbers. And you know why I'm all about numbers? Because every number has a name, and every name has a story, and every story needs redemption from Jesus. We are about. And so Jesus saw Matthew. He, he wasn't just a number. He was a person who was in a hopeless situation. And so I want you to know if you're here tonight and your life looks dismal, your life looks like it is hopeless, Jesus sees you and your situation and your circumstance. Jesus went on from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Now, here's what you got to understand. Matthew was a tax collector. And I know for most of us, our mind immediately goes to like IRS agents. Okay, that's where our mind goes. But, but in the day of Jesus, a tax collector wasn't as refined as what we even think of an IRS tax agent, okay? You see, in the day of Rome, um, they would actually contract out tax collectors. So like you could receive the contract to collect taxes on behalf of Rome. And so I would, I would have a certain amount that I'm required as a contractor to bring in to Rome. But I could use whatever means necessary to tax the people that I am over. As long as Rome got theirs. And so tax collectors would tax everything. They taxed everything. And, and, and it's interesting, they were kind of in a class of their own. Nobody befriended the tax collector. But it says that Jesus saw Matthew. Now, I don't know why Matthew was a tax collector. I, I don't know what he had done. I don't know if he... he um, desired to do that or if it was a lot given to him in life but when you become a tax collector and that is your source and your your lot in life that's a pretty hopeless situation look at verse number 10 
verse number 10, go, or the finished part of 9, let's finish this. Follow me, he told him. Follow me, and it says Matthew got up and followed him. Now, some of us, we've read this text since we were little kids, and we don't really give much thought to that. But do you realize when Jesus called Matthew to follow me, like Matthew literally, literally got up, left everything behind, and submitted his life to Jesus? You see, he traded his hopeless situation to follow Jesus. For you and I, we, we might see that as some sort of symbolic gesture but it's not. Matthew literally traded his life to follow Jesus. You see, Jesus saw him and saw his life and his situation. It was pretty hopeless. And one of the reasons I love our church is over and over and over again, I've met people in the, the doldrums of life who were hopeless, but they met a man named Jesus that saw them, that transformed them, that turned the world upside down and restored hope. You see, I love our church because hope is restored to people. I, I love our church because it doesn't matter what lot or station in life, you're welcome at the table. You see, there's hope for everyone who starts out hopeless. In fact, let me just show you this. Let me demonstrate this real quick. How many of you in this room, at one time or another, you found yourself hopeless without Jesus? Look around. That's all of us. That's all of us. And I love it because we're not faking. We're not shucking and jiving. We're real. My life, even as pastor, gets messed up and jacked up, takes a hard left turn. I'm dealt situations that I'd rather not live in and with. You see, there's hope for those without hope. And not only that, not only does, does our church give hope through Jesus, but number two, I believe that through our church, Jesus provides a heart for not only us, but our entire community. I think through our church, Jesus provides a heart for us. There's a story told of a, of a young man who um, was invited to church, and finally, after lots and lots of invites, he finally tells his friend that, yes, I will go to church with you. Now, you got to understand this. Um, th this church is a prominent church, and they're on television, okay? And, and the gentleman who had done the asking and the inviting, he sat on the front row. And when he arrived at his friend's house to pick him up after he finally, finally agreed, after many invites to church that he would go, he shows up. And his friend comes out of the house, and he's wearing a black shirt with some bright yellow text on the front that says, Crazy Mother Beep. Yeah, if you don't know that, maybe, maybe ask someone that's uh, about 15. They'll tell you. Uh, but it said, Crazy Mother Beep. And um, you know many of us, if that were our friend, we'd be like, Hey, hey, whoa, buddy, let's, uh, let's stop by Walmart. Let, let's, let's go back in and get you something more presentable to wear. And, and, but he didn't. He, he took him to church. And, and now this is the crazy part. He walks into the church and he goes down to the front and the music begins and the dude responds like to the music like as if maybe he were at like a concert. People looked at him and said, well, maybe he is a crazy mother. Beep, because... We don't act like that in our church. And the preacher came out and began to, to preach a message, and he leaned in intently. And when the pastor gave an invitation to trade your hopelessness for the heart and the life of Jesus, he responded enthusiastically and gave his heart and his life to Jesus that day. And I know we go, amen. Yes. But my question is, would he make it through our front door? 
I love our church because our church has given many of us a heart for people, where they're at, and who they are. I, I, wonder, I wonder how we respond and if we're guilty of trying to, to, to operate as the church something like this. Well, when you believe the way I believe and you behave the way that I behave, then we'll give you your opportunity to belong. You see, if you read the scripture, if you look in the text, you will never see that the church is a place where you have to believe and behave to belong. In fact, the body of Christ is a place, listen to me, that if we will take our judgmental, hypocritical self and we put ourselves in check and we realize that we're redeemed under the blood of Jesus and we just give and create an environment and an atmosphere where people can meet and experience Jesus, I promise you, every time they will respond with a life change in Jesus you see I love our church and I think through Jesus he gives us a heart for the lostness around us let's see what he does in verse number 10 in verse number 10 it says while Jesus was having dinner he was having dinner at Matthew's uh oh Matthew's house. He, he, he's having a, a party hanging out with Matthew in Matthew's part of the neighborhood. In Matthew's crib, he's hanging out with Matthew, the tax collector. Now remember, he said, Matthew, come follow me. And I bet his disciples are like, whoa, whoa, hey, Jesus, psst, come here. H have you looked at his Facebook page? Bro, I don't know if you want this guy hanging out with you. I mean, like, if, if you let him follow you, like, you're going to lose Facebook and Twitter followers? Like, if you really, like, you really want him to come with you, people are going to think you approve of his behavior? And Jesus says, all dog, don't worry about it. Maybe he didn't say all dog. But he said, hey, don't worry about it. I want him to follow me. He doesn't have to believe and behave before he starts hanging out with me. Because in return, if he hangs out with me, eventually he will believe and his behavior will change to the glory of God. You see, I love our church and I love Jesus because he really gives us a heart to love. Now he's hanging out at Matthew's house. Now check this out. It's not just Matthew, but it says many tax collectors and what and sinners I, I want you to get this being a tax collector like like it was a category of their own like like there's tax collectors and then there's sinners you see like like the prostitute is even going dog y'all need to cut that out I like, just stop that like, like the tax collector is a sinner in their own category. It says that he had gathered with tax collectors and sinners. They came and they ate together with him and his disciples. You see, Jesus did not wait. Jesus did not wait for them to believe and to change their behavior and become just like he and his disciples. He simply provided an opportunity to hang out alongside the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who just being in his very presence evokes a changed life. You see, I love, I love that I can look across this room and I see person after person who came to me, many of you right up here, and you said, I've got this. I've got an addiction. I've got a marital issue. I've got a financial issue. My kids are driving me batty. Whatever it is that you brought to this altar, I, I didn't say let's change those things. I simply have told many of you, hey, would you do me a favor? Would you just keep coming back? Would you just continue to fall in love with Jesus? And as people have come back and they've continued to fall in love with Jesus, their lives are transformed and restored and they get off to a new start, not because of anything we've done. It's because we only can do this one thing, and that's point men and women to Jesus. That's it. You see, through Jesus and 
through our church, we provide a heart for people. He says in verse number 11, well, let, me, let me share this with you. This is good stuff. Jesus liked people. Jesus liked people that were nothing like him. And if you write this down, this is a good quotable. Jesus liked people that were nothing like him. And people that were nothing like him, they kind of liked him. Think about that. Jesus liked people that were nothing like him. And in return, people that were nothing like him liked him. I, I, I recently have gotten in the habit of hanging out with law enforcement guys um, through my role as chaplain at the Scott County Sheriff's Office. And um, about a week or so ago, I got in a situation where, where I literally um, was, was at the Sheriff's Office for like 31 consecutive hours involved in a situation. And there were law enforcement guys that, that man, the way that they deal with stuff is just crude humor. I mean, like they are in denial about the seriousness of life, and so they just kind of cope by trying to be funny. And, and man, they, they talk like sailors, and it, it's just crazy. Um, but, but I heard today of a conversation that took place. I said, you know what? You know what I really appreciated about Chad being there? Is he never once said, stop it. He never once, he never once had the ministry of stop it. Now, many of you, you feel empowered. You've received a changed life in Jesus, and you feel empowered, and you have the ministry of stop it. Some of you are like, just stop it. I, I know what you did last summer. I know what you did last night. I know what you two are going to do tonight, and you just need to stop it. Jesus didn't have the ministry of stop it. He never had the ministry of stop it. He loved people where they were. He liked people that were nothing like him. And as a result, people that were nothing like him kind of didn't like him. We've been called to be salt and light, to stand. Now hear me, to stand in our redemption and, and understand where we've been and where we've been set free. Number three, not only does Jesus give us a heart, but number three, through our church, Jesus provides healing. He provides healing for us. Look at verse number 12. On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. Now, I, I imagine Jesus is around the table with his disciples, with the tax collectors and the sinners. And Jesus is making a declaration. He says, it's not, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but, but the sick. I mean, I, I could see Jesus going, but the sick. And, and, and acknowledging those around the table were sick. It's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. Whoa, Jesus just called them out. And I know, listen, I know. We, we've been talked about and people say, well, y'all don't call out sin. Yeah, we do. But, but we do it like Jesus just did. Check it out. He said, it's the sick. And then the other reality is, those who are sick, check it out. They usually know they're sick. Sinners who are living a life of sin apart from the Savior Jesus, they know that they're living in sin, and they know they're living a life apart from the Savior Jesus. And so Jesus declares at the table, hey, it's not the healthy that need a doctor. It's the sick. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, time out. Jesus, you just, you just kind of like wandered up into my house, and, and like you, you had my food, and, and you drank my wine, or if you're Baptist, grape juice. I mean, you just like had my, my food at the table, and now you're, you're calling me sick? You see, Jesus could address their sickness because he addressed them as a person and involved himself with them and rolled his sleeves up, and he did a little bit of life with Matthew and the tax collectors. He accepted and received him, not where he was, but despite where he was. 
You see, he says it's the sick, and then he says this. But go and learn what this means. Go and learn what this means. And he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous. I have not come to call the righteous, but the what? The sinner. I love my church because this is not a place where you have to have it all figured out and you have to get your act together before you come. You see, if that's your perspective when you're looking for potential individuals to invite, you're looking with the wrong lens and the wrong eyes. If you want to look at the lens and the eyes of Jesus, you will find lost people who are up to their eyeballs in over their head in sin. And you will bring them face to face with the Savior of the universe. His name is Jesus. You see, we love to quote John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we stop there. But, but as the church, as the bride of Christ, we've got to go to verse 17. I have not come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Jesus came as the hope eternal for everyone that chooses to believe. You see, I think we can learn a lot through Matthew and his story. Because I think Matthew's story is a whole lot like our own. You see, we're all sinners. And had it not been for Jesus, we were only one heartbeat away from a sinner's hell. You see, I love our church because through Jesus, we're able to provide hope. Through Jesus, we're able to obtain a heart to see people in our community the way that he sees our community. And through our church, I believe that Jesus is able to provide healing and restoration and hope and redemption and then listen to me it's not through anything that we have to offer other than Jesus himself that's it the hope for your neighbor the hope for your spouse the hope for your co-worker the hope for your children is in Jesus you see it is never from the very first day it's never been the intent of this church that you need to believe and behave to belong. It's always been, we want to provide a place where you can belong, you can believe, and you're transformed, and your behavior will follow. You see, Matthew didn't have it all together when he said, come, follow me. In fact, I'm just going to be honest. As your pastor, I, I don't know it all. I mean, in fact, if you ask me uh, about the book of Revelation, it comes down to this. There's a dude, um, he's dressed in white, robe dipped in blood. There's a black horse, there's a white horse, there's eyes of fire, there's big swords, there's, there's absolute destruction, and then there's some trumpets, and at the end, we win. Glory to God. That's what I know. So I, I'm just telling you, on this journey, it's not about belief and behavior. It's about the church being a place where Jesus, listen to me, can be lifted high. You know what Scripture says? When Jesus is lifted high, when he's lifted high, he is about the business of drawing men and women unto himself. You see, I love our church. I love our church because we're a bunch of messed up, jacked up individuals who, by the grace of God, have had a second chance, and a third chance, and a fourth. And if you're like me, a whole lot more. You see, I don't know where you're at tonight, but, but I know that we've all been in a place where we've been hopeless. And for some of you, that might be the place you're at tonight, and you simply need to respond and meet Jesus. The only thing I have to offer you tonight is a relationship with Jesus. And so I'm going to invite Jake and our worship team to come and, and I would encourage you, if that's you tonight, to receive the free gift of salvation that comes through Jesus. If you're here and you don't have a place to call home, you don't have a, a church where, where you can just belong and you can go on that journey, because here's the deal, how many of you got kids? How many of you got kids? Have you got grandkids? Some of you do. You, you see, here's the, 
here's the, the situation. When our children start to toddle around the house, you see, they, they seem to take a step or two forward, and then what happens? They fall on their face, but we yell, he's walking! <coughs> She's walking! And they're not really walking. All they're doing is falling forward, right? And trying to outrun their big head. But when, when they fall forward, we get the cameras. We get the video camera. We call grandma. We call grandpa. But in the body of Christ, we're the only institution, we're the only army that we had rather shoot our wounded than to celebrate the advancement of moving forward. You, you see, you don't, you don't kick your little toddler out because they failed to walk. You pick them up and you dust them off. You allow them to belong. And then you celebrate the advancement of their journey in growing as a young child. The church is to be no different. We are to celebrate the steps forward. You see, some of you, you're learning to walk, and some of you, you've fallen on your face, and, and you've been to that church where they just say, Get up and stop it! Nobody likes to be a part of that. And you're looking for a place just to belong. And they say, hey, good job. Let's dust you off. You'll get it. In fact, let me, let me hold your hand the next time. Let's take a few steps. And we turn them loose. You see, God calls us to love the bride of Christ. To engage as and in the body of Christ. So I'm going to ask you all across the worship center to stand to your feet tonight. I want you to respond however you feel like the Lord is leading you tonight. The altar's open. And for some of you, maybe during our time of worship, you didn't slide back and you didn't, you didn't write anything on the paper at the table back there, but, but maybe now that God's reminded you where you were and how you were received and, and whatnot, and, and maybe just during this time of invitation, you need to respond by going back and just declaring, I love the church because they gave me a second chance. They restored hope just by being the hands and feet of Jesus, whatever it is. And then also, in your version notes, maybe you need to find just a quiet spot or just sit down in a moment. But, but the final question in your version notes is, so, why do you love your church? And you have an opportunity to respond there. I would encourage you to do that. Father God, we come before you tonight. And we thank you that, God, you love the church. In fact, God, you sent your son Jesus to redeem us, to restore us. God, I pray that we would continue to keep our eyes on Jesus, that we would be that place where people can belong during this journey. God, where they are taught and they're able to understand your word and they grow in that. Lord, their life begins to change and their belief and their faith level grows and their, their behavior is transformed. God, ultimately, we want every individual that comes through the doors of this church, God, not to look like us, but to look like your son, Jesus. And so, God, may we conduct ourselves in a way that, God, we really, really live that. That, God, we love people through the journey. That, God, we provide hope and Lord, we, we carry out your heart. We extend healing. God, may we respond as the body of Christ. We pray that in Jesus' name. Would you respond tonight as we sing?